five local authorities. Okay, thank you. Um, Helen, please. Hello everybody, my name's Helen Gray from Government Services. I'm here just to purely support the meeting today. Thank you. Um, Debbie, please. Sorry, Debbie. I'm, <laughs> I just want to sort out the live stream. <laughs> it's Debbie Alden from Governance Services. Thank you. And John, please. Good afternoon, everyone. John Grieve. I'm from Governance Services at Leeds City Council, and I'll be clerk in today's meeting. Thank you. And we've got apologies from um, Councillor Farley, but Councillor Thurkill is substituting Councillor Kendrick and Councillor Forster. That's correct, Chair. So yeah. So we are just corporate. Are there any other apologies, John? I've received no other apologies, Chair. Thank you. Um, are there any appeals? Uh, there are no appeals, Chair. Um, and we do have some exempt information, don't we? Under item agenda, under agenda item two, exclusion of the press and public. Um, when we get to agenda item nine, appendix two of the head of service report, uh, there's some information about marketing strategy, so we'll take that in the, the closed session if that's okay. Okay, so we are we are um, live streaming at the moment, aren't we? And we'll stop at that point. That's right. So so if we can just give an indication to, to Debbie to switch off the microphone when we arrive at that point, that'd be useful. Sure. Okay. Any late, late items? I'm not aware of any late items of business. Um, any declarations of disposable pecuniary interest? No? Okay. We're, sorry, we've done apologies already. Slightly the wrong order. Um, okay, so if we go on to minutes, and that is arising from the last meeting, which was on Valentine's Day, Friday the 14th of February. Um, every meeting that I've chaired in the last few weeks, I've said just like previous meetings feel like a different world and it's a different lifetime, don't they? Okay, so what we'll do, we'll take matters of correction and matters arising at the same time. So uh, is there anything anyone wants to correct or um, speak about on page one? Actually, it's page seven. Um, no, okay, page eight. Just come in, Sarah, if you've got any matters arising on anywhere. Yeah. Um, page can, nine. Can I say, Councillor Ben? Can I say, Councillor Ben? I'm not sure whether it was me that submitted the report and the summary of developments from One Adoption West. I think it would probably be the director in Leeds. I think okay. that's just a. Is that a type? Is that a mistake? I don't think it was our report. Was it mine as the management? Board? No, that's was right. It? That's what right. Is? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, because. But, uh, Council hosts the agency, it will be the Director of Children's Services for Leeds that, that, that submitted that report to you, not me. Okay. That's all. It's okay. just a, yeah, a slight correction. Thank you. Okay, anything on page eight? Sorry, was that page eight? Yeah. Page nine. Yeah, just to, to say that we circulated the video uh, about people <laughs> sharing their experience of adoption. Yeah, it's really moving. Did people get a chance to look at it? It was circulated after the last meeting. It's really lovely. Um, okay, anything on page 10? Okay. Excuse me, Catherine. Must... Sorry, yes. just back to page nine again. It says again that Calderdale, that I submitted the report. And it has, it, again, John, it just needs changing to be the director of Leeds at the top. It's a half year. Yeah. No problem. I can do that. Just a comment on page eight and nine, Chair, if that's okay. Of course. Um, yeah, just regarding it references work on uh, on adoption allowances and special guardians, just to, just to mention that there were two cabinet papers that went through in Calderdale recently um, as a result of the work that has been undertaken on that to bring our, um, our rates in line with the rest of, of the region and, and bring them up. So I just, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I was going to mention this when we get on to the second report, actually, because there's been the regional piece of work, plus what we've all been doing in our separate authorities, hasn't there? Um, thank you. Anything else in terms of matters arising? Nothing from me, Councillor Venner. Okay. 
Are we okay to move on? So we've got two main reports today. Um, the first of which is the annual report of one adoption, and then we've got the we've got Sarah's report that we get at each meeting. So I'll hand over to Sarah to do an introduction. The only point I wanted to make at this stage was that um, Sarah has put information about COVID-19 and our response from the beginning of this report because although that happened late in the year with the report being April to March, obviously it's had a very profound impact on how the services operated. So it would have seemed very strange to uh, circulate this report without extensive reference to COVID. So that's woven through the reports and is referenced right from the beginning. So I'll hand over to Sarah to make further introductory comments and then we can open it up for comments and questions. So whenever you're ready, Sarah. Thanks, Councillor Venner. Um, yes, the uh, first report is the annual report, and it's also uh, regarding the statement of purpose, which an adoption agency has to have um, to operate. So I'll reference the statement of purpose in a minute. But just in terms of the annual report, I thought um, the first point really, as Councillor Venner says, was about the impact of COVID-19. Um, and um, I just thought it'd be helpful just to highlight for you about how we've had to adapt the service in order to kind of respond and I guess the main thing to say is that we've just been really surprised, actually, at the kind of people who are really interested in adoption. So we've had lots and lots of applications for people interested in wanting to adopt at a time when we thought that people actually would probably hunker down and, and not really think about these sorts of things. We've actually been very, very surprised. So we've continued to get a lot of inquiries. We had to adapt the way that we kind of share that information with the public. So we've now gone on to a kind of um, online information events, uh, which have proved to be very popular. We think that we're going to keep those going forward. Um, and we've been doing sort of regular Facebook question and answer sort of sessions to be able to answer, answer questions. We've had to adapt all the preparation training. So we've not been able to do any of our preparation training. We've had to adapt it to go all online. And again, with our sort of support groups and adoption support offer, we've not been able to do any of the group work that we normally do. So again, we've had to we had to suspend things initially and then readapt, and the staff had to kind of reframe and, and re sort of purpose all the, the information. Um, so I guess we've kind of had to continue business as usual. Um, the staff, I have to say, have been absolutely amazing. Um, they've gone over and above really what's expected. Many of them, you know, as you're aware, have been working from home with children, homeschooling, um, that have continued to kind of work and we've been putting in a lot of support to make sure that the staff are well supported. One of the big issues for us has been around health in terms of the GPs, because of course we need GPs to do the health assessments of adopters um, and they've not been able to offer appointments for quite some time. We've, we've done quite a lot of work with our CCGs in the region. Um, and we now are at a point where some GPs are doing face-to-face -face medicals some are doing a kind of um, call them virtual online kind of assessments. And we've had some flexibilities from the government about being able to move people from stage one to stage two in the process, pending the outcome of their medical assessment. So we haven't got to a point yet where we've had to approve somebody where there's been an issue about the health assessment. Um, so we're just trying to stage it and try and keep people going through the process. So we, we are likely to have a kind of a backlog, had a backlog. Um, of people coming through. So in September and October, we're going to reach a bit of a, a bulge in terms of a pinch point in terms of needing to allocate work to, to, those, to those workers. So uh, we're keeping an eye on that. The adoption panels. Um, adoption panels have been taking place on um, Skype for Business. Um, and those have been going okay. We've had a few little bumps in the road. It's very different managing a panel online than it is face to face, which has meant that our capacity um, hasn't been as much as we would normally have it. So we've had to we've had to increase our adoption panels from seven panel panels a month to nine panels a month and consider moving up from considering three items to four items, which means we can do 36 items per month. And it doesn't seem to be enough at the moment. Um, so um, that that's proved to be challenging for us. But I think generally as a service, we've try to make sure that we've communicated with the staff and with our service users to make sure that they're aware about how we're kind of delivering and developing the service at, at this moment in time. So that's a bit of background information about how we've responded to sort of COVID-19. Um, 
just moving through the report, if I just highlight a couple of elements for you. Um, I think obviously we did a lot of work last year around the Centre for Excellence project, working with health and education. And we were delighted to get some additional funding from the CCGs across the region and the local authorities to implement the multidisciplinary team. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more when I come to the second report, but it was just great to be able to kind of get that support from the local um, local region just to be able to implement that new sort of style of working and that much more integrated approach. Um, in terms of performance, um, we can see that the number of adopters that we have approved in the last year has gone up again, very slightly from last year. So if you remember when we went into the agency, we only approved 60 nine families and we've now taken that up to 113 which is which is really good um we do feel that that target is going to be stretched again this year we were aiming for around 130 um it'll be interesting to see where covid how how that impacts but certainly the numbers coming through are very encouraging so it's good that we've had a you know a slight increase um in terms of the children um We've matched 169 children, uh, similar to last year, around 172 children last year. We had a number of children that we couldn't actually place in March because of the, the pandemic. Uh, we had to suspend moving children onto adoption for a very short period of time whilst we undertook individual risk assessments. Um, and I'm pleased to say that a lot of those children now have actually moved on to their, their adopted families. In terms of the provision of provision of placements, of course, we place children in house, but we also purchase placements from the voluntary agencies across the country. Um, and this year, we placed 64% of children in house uh, compared to last year, which was 59%. So it's encouraging that we're placing more children locally. Um, and we've just recently, I'll, I'll come on to talk about it in my next report, entered into a contract with the voluntary agencies in the region to provide 30 placements for us um, for those children who, if you like, wait longer and are more difficult to place because of their additional needs. So we're hoping that we'll be able to place more children um, locally. Um, in terms of the scorecard data, so on page 22 and 23, um, you'll see that the adoption scorecard is a key performance indicator which is nationally set, which looks at the timescales from children entering care in terms of the A1 indicator and the time that they're placed with their adoptive family. And you can see that across the region that has gone up. Um, and additionally, for adoption scorecard A2, which is the point that you get permission to place a child and the, and the time that you match that child, both of those indicators have gone up, which means that children, some children are, have waited longer in order to be placed for adoption. And that's a, a key area for us and a key challenge. And I think there's a number of factors for that. I think part of it is to do with the fact that nationally there's been a, a smaller pool of adopters. And I guess whenever you get a smaller pool of adopters, they always generally have the first choice about the types of children that they want to adopt. And therefore you often find that those children who do wait longer are more difficult then to find a family for. I think what's encouraging about these statistics is that actually when you look at the numbers of children who are more complex, old children over five, sibling groups, black and minority ethnic children, we are actually securing adoption for them so that's a good thing. So I know that um, we had a discussion at the management board last week about this very issue about actually in some areas you know the old, older children, should we actually be realistically looking for adoption for them or you know should we actually be looking at other plans and I think the conversation that we had was actually we need to be aspirational for our children in terms of securing permanence for them but you need to regularly review the plans for those children and make sure that actually the plan is the right plan. Julie I don't know if you want to say anything about about that element of the discussion that we had last week. Yeah I will, I will come in Sarah thank you yeah we, we've been doing work for, for many many years on permanency planning for our children it was an area that was picked up by Ofsted going way back in 2015 so we rig rigorously pursue permanency plans and adoption where we can and I raised it at the board because I wondered whether we were looking for adoptive placements for children and um, particularly at the older age range where realistically 
it, it may not happen. And, and Sarah reminded me of a case where we'd actually placed a 10 year old um, and gave us an example of a 10 year old we've managed to find a family for, which is absolutely fabulous. And everybody in the board agreed it's a balance between being ambitious and aspirational for our children and giving them the best chance of a permanent family. But just reviewing that, as Sarah said, of making sure those permanency plans are under regular review. And at the point where we can't identify an adoptive family, there's a, a legal process called a rescind that, you know, that we do that says, OK, we can't find an adoptive family. Uh, we'll look for permanency elsewhere, maybe with the foster family. So I did raise it, but I do think um, we're doing the right thing. You know, we're looking for families for, for, for you know, for, 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 for a time limited period 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 and giving our children the best chance so I did raise it but I was assured as chair of the board that you know our practice is sound um, and that we are being uh, ambitious and aspirational as Sarah said for our children where we can thank you Julie um okay just moving on a little bit in the report I just wanted to highlight um the disruptions because I think when a, when an adoptive placement breaks down and a child returns to care that's always an issue for that individual child and family and we never want that to happen um, and we have had seven disruptions in the last year across the five authorities and that relates to six placements because two of the children were in a sibling group and this is a slight increase from the previous year where we had four disruptions um, and we've done some analysis of that just to see if there's some learning that we need to kind of to think about how can we prevent this from happening before and what was interesting was that the majority of those arrangements were for children where we place them at a distance from Leeds or from West Yorkshire as a whole in two of the cases um you know the the risks we knew that the, the placements if you like were a bit risky initially so again we had a nine-year-old where we were looking at placing that child um, and we knew that there would be a need for therapeutic support. And I guess the issue about access to local services is something that we need to be really clear about when we're placing children at a distance. So what kind of support can we wrap around that, that child and family? So I'm really pleased that we've now got this contract with our local voluntary agencies, the aim of which is to try and find those families for those children who are older so that we can place them more locally and we can wrap around more local support. So that, that's the aim of that. So it's just an important thing for us to keep an eye on and I know our adoption panels look at that very carefully. Um, I think probably those are the main sort of highlights for me from the annual report and I'm sure that you've got questions so I'm more than happy to answer any questions on the annual report itself Councillor Venner. Thank you Sarah. Uh, just to let people know Jolene Hodgson who's just come into the room is, is my researcher. Okay, so um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, I'll make, I'll bring up a couple of points if, if no one else um, has anything at the moment. So um, I was interested, Sarah, in what you said about the, the increase in number of inquiries about adoption and that not necessarily being what we expected. I don't know if this is the same in Bradford and Coolsdale, but during the pandemic and lockdown, we also had a huge, huge increase in interest in fostering. So um, between like April 18 and Mar eight, eight, April 19 and March 20, we had a net increase, I think, of eight foster carers over that year, because I think we'd registered 40 new foster carers, but deregistered 32 who were retiring or doing staying puts. Um, but then just in a two month period that I think was like March to May, we had a net increase of six. And then in one month, which I think was May, we have 97 people register interest on our website for fostering, which is just incredible. Okay. Um, and I don't know if it's because um, some I, I, I can't remember where I was, but someone told me there's a huge increase in people who are applying to be nurses at the moment. So I don't know if it's that people during this period of crisis have been re-evaluating their lives. I mean, some people may have been forced to by unemployment, but I, I hope people have take, I have hugely thought, you know, thought about what they want to do next. And a lot of people have decided fostering or adoption is a route they want to pursue, but we've had a huge increase in fostering inquiries as well, which is amazing because again, we may have anticipated the opposite, but actually it feels re really positive. Yeah. Um, the only other thing, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that or anything else, otherwise I'll move on to my next point, which isn't related. 
Okay, um, the other area I was wondering if maybe you could comment on Sarah that's in the report is, because um, this is in both reports, the ongoing challenge around not having enough BAME um, uh, adopters and uh, particularly, I know this is an issue in fostering as well, particularly black, African and black Caribbean families. Um, and obviously you've referenced that being brought into focus by Black Lives Matter as well. Mm -hmm. So who wants to comment on some of the work around trying to increase BAME uh, adopters. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really um, good point, an important point, Councillor Venner, because uh, we've traditionally always had difficulties around that Black African, Black Caribbean community. And we've been working with an organisation in the last uh, the last nine months um, called My Foster Family, which has now adapted itself to become My Adoption Family. It's a small organisation from Bradford that's predominantly worked with the Muslim community. Um, and some of the work I've been doing on the National uh, Recruitment Steering Group for Adoption is we engaged an organisation called MMC who have been doing some particular kind of uh, research and insights into the Black African and Black Caribbean communities. Because when you look at the children that are waiting uh, across West Yorkshire, but also nationally, there's a disproportionately number of children who are either Black African, Black Caribbean, but also mixed heritage with some elements of Black Caribbean or Black African heritage. Um, and those communities have, have, there's been quite a lot of barriers in terms of them coming forward to potentially want to adopt issues around fear of authority, uh, given kind of issues around the Windrush, about Grenfell, about COVID impact of COVID-19. Um, and actually, the Black Lives Matter really has helped us to focus our attention. And it's an opportunity for us to think about how do we re-engage with some of those communities to try and feel like work with the community to recognise that very often these children are disproportionately represented within the care system and therefore need adoption. So my adoption family has been looking to um, look at a number of community organisations across West Yorkshire that we can link into. Uh, and we've got a meeting planned with them at the beginning of September. We're inviting them to a webinar to look at what are some of the barriers within the local communities and how can we then start to do some outreach work um, to actually get people more interested in not just adoption, but also fostering. Because I know that's a big issue. Um, and I think we felt that engaging a third sector organisation to do that work might actually, if you like, help broker some of those community relationships. Um, and I know that, you know, sometimes people are very worried about social workers coming in and doing assessments so that we can try and work with the community to think about how we how we um, increase, if you like, the inquiries that are coming from those particular groups. In, interestingly, we, we have a lot of interest uh, uh, from Southeast Asian uh, communities in terms of adoption and yet we don't have as many of those children to place for adoption so there's a more of an educative kind of information giving and sharing approach with those communities about the sorts of children that we would need those communities to consider um you know dual heritage children children who might not necessarily be from a muslim background but might not necessarily have any religion and how would people feel about parenting those children so we've got different approaches that we need to take with different elements of the different communities um, but it's a uh, it's an area that we're really keen to drive forward this next year so we're hoping that this new approach will will really help us to to deliver that so i'd be interested to hear if any councillors have got particular ideas or suggestions about how we might be able to take that forward in your particular area and whether there's a particular link that we could make with your colleagues that would be great hi um I um, actually had this report at our last corporate parenting panel and I actually passed on to Michelle some organisations that I thought, some community organisations that I thought you might be able to get in touch with for, from the black and African communities. And oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure those will be taken up at some stage, but I have mentioned at least two organisations within the Bradford district who they might want to approach to uh, see if they could make some inroads into the, those communities for exactly this reason. Thanks, Councillor Thurkill. Thank you. Does anyone else have, have any questions or comments? No, okay. Um, we, we've got the appendices to the report as well, like the Equality Impact Assessment talks about this in a bit more depth and also the statement of purpose that we need to include yes. with this report. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, the statement of purpose, Councillor Venner, there's very minor amendments being made this year. Um, there's just a couple of staffing names that have changed in terms of the team managers. But generally speaking, it's pretty much the same as last year and it's an annual, um, if you like, we just need to update it and make sure that you're happy with it on an annual basis. Thank you. Do you want to say anything else about any of the appendices or the report before we move on? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that the report from uh, young people and adopters is really helpful just to get their comments about, you know, their input in terms of why, why we're developing elements of the service and their feedback. I think that's really helpful to get. It's always great to hear from people, isn't it, directly? So there's some really encouraging points that I think people have raised in that. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, so the next report is the head of service report. Um, before Sarah introduces this, the, the only thing I wanted to refer to is I when when um, bef when we, we had our, when I had my chair's briefing, I asked Sarah to put some information into the report that wasn't there before about the um, coronavirus uh, amendment, the, the flexibilities that were introduced. Um, and the reason I wanted this to be in is because obviously they've been massively, massively contentious. Um, with everyone from you know the children's commissioner to um, opposition and and conservative MPs and children's charities cam campaigning and lobbying against the existence of the regulations. So I wanted us to have as a as a committee have have quite a good overview of how they were being used across West Yorkshire and across well across one adoption. Within Leeds, I've taken quite, I've had, I've had um, quite an overview of this really because for a couple of reasons really. One is that we're obviously a really big authority and I felt it was important that we kept a, a record of how we were using them in case we were asked. Not, not least because um, the Children's Minister has claimed to have consulted with local authorities prior to the introduction of the flexibilities which I don't think actually happened. But also, as you'll be aware, our, our council leader, um, Judith Blake, is the is the chair of the Children and Young People's Board for the Local Government Association and so obviously is involved in a national role around um, children and young people. And I wanted to, to be able to give her really clear information about what was happening in Leeds that can help inform her national role. So I've taken quite an interest in anyway in the um in the flexibilities and how they are or aren't being used but and I felt it was really important that we did the same as committee um, so there so there is reference to the decisions that are being made outside panel and why um, in September um, when they've been in place for six months I'm going to ask within Leeds for a report on it, when they've been used uh, uh, in what circumstances they've been used within within our authority although I'm also getting informed each time they're used anyway um, yeah, but I thought it was important. We had an overview. So, um, Sarah, I'll hand over to you to introduce the report. Yes, yes, we, we are keeping a log, Councillor Venner, of all the times that we do use the flexibilities around adoption. Um, and to be fair, we haven't had to use them a huge amount, but I think because of the impact on the um, adoption panels with regards to the capacity available, we were finding that we're not able to book a panel date until October. So we did a piece of work to look at, OK, if that's where we are, what are the items that we think we could safely potentially could take out of the panel and go directly to the agency decision maker? And those are the categories that we talk about in, on page 81, the approval of experienced adopters. And that's because those adopters will have already previously been approved by an adoption panel or recommended by an adoption panel. Um, the approval and match of foster care adoptions, because again, those foster carers will have already been through some approval process. The approval and match of sibling adopters, again, similar sort of idea that uh, there's been some kind of, if you like, oversight and panel oversight of, um, and scrutiny around those adopters previously. And then the only category that we wanted to take a slightly different approach was there's the approval of those adopters who could consider early permanence because very often we don't have a big pool of those adopters, but those are to do with newborn babies very often when the local authority decides that actually they need um, to consider a fostering for adoption placement, and therefore those adopters can be temporarily approved as foster carers. So it's not the decision to place the child, it's the approval of those adopters. 
so we've only had to i think i think every authority has done at least one uh in terms of taking it out of panels so i know that um i think irfan makes a decision in bradford carol um rob murray's made a decision in coldale uh, council wilkinson um, and we've had a few decisions in leeds and in each local authority, it has to be at least the head of service or above who makes the decision to agree that an item can come out of panel. Um, and as I say, we've only done it on a very small, less than 10 overall in terms of um, the five local authorities. We've had uh, to use the quarracy reduction on two panels because somebody rang in sick at the last minute and rather than delay all of the items, we decided to go ahead. And the other flexibility we're using is within the adopter process of their assessment, which is to do with the health and medicals, uh, which is which I talked about earlier, was, which is because the GP's assessments aren't taking place. So it allows you to move from stage one to stage two in the assessment process, pending the outcome of the medical. Um, we can't approve people without the medical. It just allows us to move people through a bit quicker. Uh, than, than, and than we needed to and we've only used that on four occasions so um, we are keeping a log of, log of it and I know that each local authority takes it very seriously and they are really about when we absolutely feel it would prevent child from moving on in terms of the delay to the child and it wouldn't be in their best interest to delay things. Thank you Sarah, do you want to make any other comments as an introduction to this report? Um, so I think very helpfully, you did mention the adoption allowances and, and special guardianship allowances um, earlier. So in the last three months, we have um, taken some of that forward um, and we had a really good discussion at the management board about that. As, as Councillor Wilkinson said, Calderdale have now taken that through their cabinet. All of the other authorities are in the process of doing that. I think some are booked on in August. Um, one piece of work that isn't completed around that, which was delayed due to COVID, was the, the work around the financial assessment tool, uh, which is a new means testing document uh, that the, the oldest one we're using at the moment is around from 2005. Uh, so there's been a huge amount of work going on and we met last week to, we're starting to test that now across the five authorities. Um, and in September, we'll be clear about whether there's any implications from that testing, um, if you like, any resource issue, any issues about how do you carry out one assessment compared to the one that you're already undertaking? Are there any implications that we need to consider? Um, it's great that we've been able to get uh, one of our managers, Rian Bain, and we've released a half a week to do some of that coordination work around special guardianship that I know we've talked about before at the Joint Committee, um, really to start to bring to, together kind of best practice starting to develop kind of support plans, assessment frameworks um, around trying to develop and improve the services to special guardians in the region. Um, so there's work ongoing around that. I think the government um, uh, released some funding from the Adoption Support Fund called uh, COVID-19 funds, and we drew down over 300,000. And some of that was for special guardians as well as for adopters. And Rian was able to commission services in, in consultation with the five local authority kinship care teams to say what are the sort of services that special guardians are asking for. Uh, and we were able to do some work around child to parent violence, um, some of the parenting groups, uh, Grandparents Plus around the peer mentoring. We've been able to extend the support for, for special guardians across the region. Um, and the idea is to see if there's more funds that we can draw down from the adoption support fund to help special guardians in the region sort of therapeutically parent the children um, and to meet the needs of some of those special guardians that we know are struggling so i'm really pleased that rian is going to be taking some of that work forward it's, it's quite it's quite uh, exciting i think and the team managers across the kinship teams are, are really pleased about that um we talked a little bit about Black Lives Matters, and certainly my teams are having discussions with their teams. Um, in terms of the workforce, we're a very kind of a white dominated workforce in adoption. Uh, it's not a particularly diverse range of staff within our, our um, agency. So we are looking as to how we can uh, improve kind of the recruitment and retention of BME staff. Um, so we're just having early discussions around some of that and I think our equality impact assessment that we're reviewing 
will start to address some of the issues for us as a service, but also as a workforce. Um, is there anything else? I don't think there's anything else I've got unless people um, have got any questions. Does anyone have any questions or comments? No, okay, thank you. Um, are we on to Councilor the- Bernard. Yes. Councillor Bernard, could I just come in on, on, the, on the freedoms and the flexibilities, yeah. if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, Because um, I think a lot, a lot of the concerns have been around um, the visiting, particularly to look after children, and the ability to do that remotely and not see them face to face, and real concerns about a kind of slip back in standards to how it used to be. Um, and I think Calderdale, like a lot of other councils, put systems in place immediately, overlaying our normal systems to make sure we had eyes on every child, reg you know, regularly between us, the schools, whoever was in that key worker network on a weekly basis. So I think I think think councils have stepped up to COVID in a way, you know, that you know it's very very caring, um, working really closely with schools in a way that, you know, you know, that we haven't, we haven't been able to, you know, in, you know, in, in COVID times. Um, and I think a lot of the flexibilities that Sarah has described, you know, making an early permanence placement plan would, would be before the courts. So, you know, it'd be, it'd, it'd be before the magistrates or a judge, there'd be an independent reviser, there'd be the guardian appointed by the court. So there are lots of other safeguards that we do have within the system to make sure the planning that we are making for children are right. So, so, so I think the whole issue of, of the freedoms and the flexibilities need, need to be looked at in the round because I think some are probably more concerning than others. And it just depends on whether that local authority is using them or not. And you'll probably found out in Leeds that the systems and the processes are tight and the oversight is good. Um, and you know yes we can see children remotely and families and it has assisted particularly in the early days of lockdown but I would say it's business as usual and I think probably I'm, I'm probably not alone in speaking for Calderdale in that social workers are out seeing families keeping eyes on children making sure they're safe but we've got to make sure as Sarah said with virtual panels and some of the other things around um, speeding up the medical process that we don't delay for children either so you know I, I just wanted to assure you from a practice point of view um, I don't think standards are slipping and I do think we have got eyes on children and I do think some of the flexibilities that Sarah's described for adoption are, are helpful for now because we are trying to operate in a in a world where we wouldn't normally we'd be doing everything face to face including recruitment so you know Sarah and the team are doing a really good job I think um, and I was pleased just to see the emphasis in the report on on COVID because it's only it's only in the last three months but to hear in detail from Sarah how the team are really responding to operating in in, in that completely changed changed environment for families so so I think she's doing you know she and the team are doing a very good job yeah absolutely thank you yeah I'd agree with you about the flexibilities and I think one of the uh, concerns that children's commissioner in particular has raised is that they're unnecessary and that our systems and our staffing have held up through through this crisis I think outside of one adoption we've used them twice um, in very, very specific circumstances, things like, I mean, don't, don't minute the diesel of this, but I think one, we had a foster placement um, disrupted because the foster care went into hospital with COVID-19 and we couldn't find a placement for the child. And we placed them with a couple who were about to go to panel the next month, but hadn't yet. And I think the other circumstances, I can't remember the diesel, but it was really similar, um, not the COVID bit, but just some kind of like, well, we didn't really have another option. It would have been like finding a placement outside of Leeds, you know, in the private sector. Um, so, yeah, I think it. I think our systems have held up really well. And similarly, we've, in many ways, um, where other executive board members have, have had their depart, you know, their departments were working in a completely different way. In many ways, it has been business as usual in children's services. Our children's homes have carried on as normal. We've had our children's centres open right the way through. Children's social work has been carrying on seeing families face to face where they need to. So I think uh, that's one of the biggest arguments against the regulations, isn't it? That they're not actually necessary because all our systems have held up throughout. Um, does anyone else have any, any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, I think uh, just, just to agree with you, really Councillor Benham, I think when those regulations came in, I think a lot of people were quite worried about them. And I did receive one or two comments from other councillors concerned about what we may or may not end up doing in Calderdale. And 
as as Julie, uh, Julie's alluded to, I kind of did ask for assurances at the time that we wouldn't be looking to be relaxing anything. And, and I think as Julie's outlined, I think that is, you know, we, we've made sure we've, we've been having, if, you know, probably had more contacts with children during COVID, if anything, um, rather than less. And we've certainly not been looking to, to relax things. Thank you. Any any other questions or comments? Okay, are we on to the exempt item? Yes, uh, yeah. yes, Councillor Venny. Okay. Yeah. So Debbie, could you stop live streaming at this point?